So we're back in the confines of a familiar room, but I don't have my drums. And uh, so what are we on a different, is this a different dispensation? I guess so. We're dispensationalists in here. Um, and so we begin at 9.30 and we finish at 10.15. And I am trying to figure all that out. But I'm grateful to see you this morning because I started off in the auditorium. And I thought, well, I guess I've taught my last lesson. They have, this is their way of running me off. All right, uh, Proverbs chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 3, and we'll go to uh, verse 9. We will skip verse 6 because we had that last time in a standalone proverb. So here is my translation. It will be a bit different than yours, but uh, verse 3, chapter 20, abstaining from strife brings glory to this individual or this person, but a fool starts a quarrel. For the sluggard does not plow from winter on, then he asks for a crop in the harvest, but there is none. And five, the counsel of a person's harp are deep waters, but an understanding person draws it out. Understanding person draws it out. What an what a amazing thought that is. Uh, we skip seven, uh, six, so we go to seven. As for the one who walks in blamelessness as a righteous person, blessed are his children after him. Now that's a, an interesting proverb because it has a promise to it, and we're not used to proverbs with a promise. Most of the time, they're just simply observations on life and instruction of how to adapt to skill. And then here is eight. A king is one who sits on a throne of judgment, winnowing all evil with his eyes. And finally, verse nine, who can say, I have cleansed my heart and I am pure from sin? Okay, so here are the way I am going to teach these proverbs. This is what I think they are saying, and I will teach them this way. Uh, verse 3, the man of honor always brings peace. Man of honor always brings peace. Verse 4, the fool never considers the consequences to his behavior. The fool never considers the consequences to his behavior. And five, wisdom gives one far more than normal seeing. Wisdom gives one far more than just normal seeing. A piercing eye inside, that's the idea. Now here's seven. Your daily wisdom will, be a, will have a lasting effect. Your daily wisdom will have a lasting effect. Here's eight. Fear the king because he rules with absolute power. Fear the king for he rules with absolute power. And then nine. 
course, it is the rhetorical answer from verse 9, who can say, I cleanse my heart, I am pure from sin, and the way I'm going to teach it, and what I think the proverb is saying, is no one, not in this life, no one. Okay, so here is the exposition beginning in verse 3. Uh, Want to be wise then, and practice the skill for living? Then avoid conflict whenever possible. Uh, this word abstain means to stop. It was used in Exodus 21 and verse 19 to stop work. So stop, don't get involved in conflict if at all possible. That's the idea. The strife here could be translated disputes and that's what you may have in your translation. We've looked at this word many times, Genesis 13, seven, used of the dispute, the strife, the conflict that broke out between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abram. And what was Abram's attitude? He brought peace to the situation by washing it all down with what? Generosity, kindness, goodness. That's what he brought in the distribution of from that point forward, he gave Lot the choices of the best of the land. And he was gracious and admirable in every way in his dealings with Lot. And so here, brings honor. Now, we've looked at that word before. It means heavy. It could be taken two ways. Here we take it as... Not riches, but it could be translated riches. It's used that way in Genesis 31.1, where the sons of Laban murmured with one another that Jacob had stolen their fathers, and here's the word. And there it is wealth. He stole our father's property in making himself rich off these spotted and speckled animals. But here, the idea of the word is honor. It is a reference to character. Uh, Job, chapter 29, verse 7, gives us a, a, pers perf a personal illustration and explanation of the word. When I went to the gate of the city and took my seat in the public square, young men saw me and stepped aside. And old men rose to their feet. The chief men refrained from speaking and covered their mouths with their hands. The voices of the nobles were hushed and their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouth. So Job is describing before his catastrophe, catastrophes hit his life, what it was like for him. He was considered a great man of reputation and honor. Look at line two. But there's your contrast to such high character. Everyone. And just like we had in verse one here of our chapter, it's a reference to the entire group. No one is excluded. They're all fools. This man carries no social weight. And he is the striking contrast to this honorable man of gravity, of wisdom, who avoids strife. The fact is that this man of character, the wise man, is much more concerned with peace than being right. Who is like that? But not the fool. Not the fool. He can't restrain himself at the first opportunity to explode and eliminate any doubt of the kind of person that he is. The fool is always at odds in the book of Proverbs with everyone. And that's why 1919, 
once you have rescued him, you'll have to do it again and again and again because that's his life. His life is one of constant irritation and conflict because he has to have his way and he is right all the time. So cocksure of himself. Always right about every matter and never wrong about any. I've been listening to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, his exposition of the book of Ephesians back in the 1950s. He came to Ephesians 2, 3, and he startled me. Here's the text. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. That was the text. And then before this packed congregation at Westminster and in London, Martin Lloyd-Jones said he saw this text and came under great conviction. He loathed himself, he said. His word, not mine. And then he described why. Always getting into discussions, he said. And always having to make my point. And my point had to be admitted as right among the group. I had to win at every occasion, he said. And he looked at this text and he saw himself. And I thought to myself, no wonder he had a packed congregation at Westminster in London in the 1950s. Because Martin Lloyd-Jones was not only a man who taught the scriptures, but he was a man who lived under what he was teaching the scriptures. Very wise. What a great man. Here is Proverbs 18:12. Humility always before honor. Here's four. The sluggard who doesn't plow in the winter season. The winter season was the time to plow in Israel because it was the wet season. But the fool doesn't do such an onerous task. The proverb contrasts the top line from winter on to look. The predicate in line two, in the harvest. You see that? Notice also the parallel. Does not plow, line one. To line two, there is not. So there's the balance. Not a contrast, but a completion. We previously discussed this lazy bones sluggard many times. He's a public disgrace. Plow here refers to the arduous work of breaking the ground. We all know that. The plow in the ancient Near East had a wooden frame with a metal point attached to a team of animals. And the farmer would be behind holding onto this plow and driving the animals forward. Now, it's of significance in 1 Kings 19.19 19, that Elisha, the prophet, was in the midst of doing just that when the Spirit of God fell upon him and he was anointed as a prophet, plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. In the midst of his work, God called him. That's a beautiful picture of how the Spirit of God moves and motivates people. Happened to me. I was doing one thing, and suddenly I wasn't. The Spirit of God suddenly came upon me and brought me to deep conviction about who I was, what I was, and I've been different ever since. Very interesting, the farmer here 
plowing in Israel. He encountered, encountered many hardships, fluctuations in precipitation, the rocky and hilly nature of the terrain, and yet all that hard work God specifically picked out that location for His people that He could bless them. But He never made it easy. They always, by the terrain that He gave them, they always had to trust Him to provide. That's why you are where you are right now in life. The terrain of your life is in a place in which you have to trust the living God. Winter here in line one is the rainy season from mid-October to April, which softens the ground to plow. But the pathetic sluggard, he lacks the energy. And so he stands idly by watching others. Line two, look, he asks with no particular thought in mind. This term to ask is used 171 times in the Old Testament. And it's fascinating to trace down where this term is often used. But it is God giving guidance and giving direction, but not to the fool. Look, he begs, that's the King James, or he asks for a year, uh, yield in the harvest, and the proverb closes, but there is none. His neglect has led to loss. By failing to labor, he deprives himself, both now and in the future. That's the fool. Without a crop, he has no seed to plant, thus he becomes a wandering beggar in Israel. Mark it well, this proverb. What he did, he did to himself. The cry of the fool, Proverbs 5, 12, and 13. How I hated discipline, he said. And my heart despised reproof. I didn't listen to the voice of my teachers, my instructors. Now think about that. You see, they were there. They, were, they extended the helping hand. They were there to give guidance and direction. But he's a fool. He doesn't listen. And he doesn't absorb the truth. He walks away from it. The fool is the man who never considers the consequences to his behavior. Never thinks about outcomes. Never thinks about what I am doing now as, and how it relates to my future. I saw it all the time in the oil business. And the young man would have great success as a geologist and have a great year and you would see him in the midst of the next year and you would talk to him and it was like he had blinders on. I'm focused. I'm, I'm, I'm focused on my work. And in a way, we applaud that. That's good to be hardworking and diligent. But, but what about your life? Where are you going with all this? You see, that's the rich fool. Luke chapter 12, a busy man, tore down his barns, built bigger barns, busy man, successful man, had to have bigger barns for a bigger crop, and they were coming. He was a busy, focused, energized man, until, until, and the until was Luke 12, 20, when God said, this night, your soul is required of you. And who's going to get all those things you've been diligently sacrificing for and working for? 
We're not the fool who doesn't, who doesn't think about consequences. We think as believers, as the wise, about consequences. The consequences to my life. We're playing a far bigger game than personal economics because they mean nothing in a short amount of time. I started developing a habit the last couple of years. I guess it's from the book of Proverbs themselves. I always, when I see a picture, I read a quote, or I think about an individual, I say it out loud. Oh, they died. Oh, they've died. Just a reminder to myself how very, very, very short this life is. Here's five. The counsel of a person's heart. Deep waters. Advice. Counsel. That's what the wise offer to the others in order to give them guidance for their lives. This opening phrase, counsel of a person's heart. And line two, it's matched by understanding. Understanding person. It constitutes the inner core of the individual. Here's where decisions are made inside. The proverb opens with counsel, which for the believer is the perceptive will of God. Here is what God would have for you in this situation, in this circumstance of life. We think of Exodus chapter 18 and verse 17, where Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, he saw this line out Moses' tent. And it went around the corner and up the hill. And he said, what you are doing is not good. That's good counsel. That's what the believer has to offer one another. So, we've already studied Proverbs 19.21. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose or will. That's what we want. We don't want my plans or your plans. We want what the Lord has for us. Always. The heart, the center of the person, and now the figure. Look at this. Deep waters. It's the idea of the unfathomable. The lexicon translates this as unintelligible speech. We had this figure in chapter 18 in verse 4. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. Have a business association or relationship with a, a man whose wife just, what can I say? She just flipped out. Didn't want to be married anymore. And he came to me. I said, I'm not qualified to talk to her. She's dead set in her decisions. But I will bring people to her. And I did. Professional people. Lawyers that had a very fine reputation as believers to bring healing to a marriage. And everybody's testimony was the same. You start off, and within a minute, she's sobbing. You can't, she's sobbing uncontrollably. She can't deal with anything. You can't communicate with her. I think that we are so limited by psychoanalysis because it's just man measuring man. We need the Word of God, and only the Word of God can reach and probe. That's what the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews tells us. Down inside the heart. That place where David says in his repentance psalm, that's what God looks at and that's what He desires. 
Here's the idea. It's Genesis 41, 16. It is jo Joseph standing before the Pharaoh, and he says God is going to give the Pharaoh a favorable answer, a good answer. Here's what you want to know. And Joseph is all of line too. He's the understanding man, as was Daniel, who before Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 2, verse 28, said, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. The term draws it up. It's used of Moses. Exodus chapter 2, verse 19, where he drew up water for Jethro's daughters in the land of Midian. That's the word. David, Psalm 30, verse 3, extols the Lord. That's the covenant name, the name of the burning bush. And David says this, for he, here's your verb, drew me up from death, from a dark place. And David says, you restored my life from among those who go down to the pit. Now, for David, he is extolling the Lord for his physical deliverance. Um, somewhat like what Paul talked about in Asia. You know the hardships, he said, that we experienced in Asia. No, we don't know them, Paul, because you never delineated them to us. But you gave us this truth that we will never forget. He said, we were beyond all hope. We thought we were goners, surely dead. But then suddenly, as God resurrects from the dead, suddenly the curtains are pulled back and we scurried away. The providence of God. That's this idea. And that was David's idea here in this psalm, Psalm 30. And the wise and the skillful are able to draw from the heart of another person deep things beneath the surface that this person doesn't even know that are there. One is able to discern and see motives that other people can't see. And this is the way David describes it in Psalm 41, 5, 6, and 7. He says, my enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? Yet when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. Now, they come in. Oh, brought you these flowers. Hey. I brought you this, brought you some balloons, put them by your bed. We just love you, miss you. David called it empty words. And their hearts at that time gathered iniquity. That's what's going on. Look, here's the bottom line. The knowledge of God gives you an advantage over anyone in the world. Any and everyone in the world. Not only do you see things that are, but you see things differently because you're wise and because you know the Scriptures. And you look into the hearts by the word of God of the common and the ordinary of the people. Here is seven. As for the one who walks in his blamelessness as a righteous person, blessed are his children after him. Our opening observation is the balancing here of the blameless, line one, to the righteous, line two. So the proverb really is telling us about the morally exceptional. There's no contrast here. 
We have two lines of truth about the same individual. Here again, the theme that we've referenced in the past. It is thinking that leads to deeds that determines destiny. Jesus' words about deeds are applicable here to our proverb. Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This blameless and righteous character, the parents are passing down to the next generation. Remember, this is a book of child training. They didn't have Bibles. It was all oral. And it went on in the Jewish home. And now we benefit because these sayings have now been codified and written. And now we are privy to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. This opening phrase, the one who walks. Now, I was just explaining this the other day to this Friday morning Bible study that I have with all these businessmen. Don't run over that phrase for the one who walks. We're not reading. If we had a pie chart, reading would be green. And it would be a tiny sliver of the pie chart. You see, what we're doing is we're studying together the Scriptures. And reading is a very small part of what we're doing. So what are we doing? Where we're doing analysis. But most importantly, what we're doing is absorbing. We're letting this Word of God absolutely drowned us with its truth. So we don't run over that phrase. And here's why. The one who walks. What's walks? What's the verb to walk? Well, it can mean several things, but primarily when I see walks, I think of the garden in the cool of the evening when the Lord God came and walked, there's your word, with the man and the woman. And what were they doing? Fellowshipping together. That's what they're doing in walking. How about the Emmaus travelers, remember? Remember their testimony? Were not our hearts burning within us as, we, as He talked to us by the way? When He opened to us the Scriptures, what were they doing? They were just walking. They were walking down the road together. They were fellowshipping. And the Word of God was being delivered more than reading. Oh, it set their hearts aflame. I have set under the ministry of the Word in my life, and I have forgotten where I am. What day it was. What's the hour? What's the time? It was just so powerful to me. So, look at this. In His blamelessness, this walking, this connected with the walk, the emphasis here is the way we live. This is the conduct of a righteous person. Both lines pointed out to us here. We would say, this is a person devoted in heart and mind. Such a person is righteous. Now what does that mean? Disadvantaging himself to always advantaging others. That's his life. That's his lifestyle. Many, many times we've referenced Job 29, 14, where the great man said he put on righteousness as his clothing. So his disposition 
is evident to all. Everybody sees it. Well, you're so different. You act so differently. And now, look at this proverb, verse 2. Here is destiny. Remember, it is thinking that leads to deeds that determines destiny. This is your future in that kind of life. Blessed are his children. What's to bless? It's power, it's potency flowing to the next generation. After him, says the proverb. That's what our text says, referring to his immediate lineage. The greatest thing that you can do for your children, for your grandchildren, is to live a godly life. That's it. That's the single greatest thing. They may not be reading the scriptures, but you are. And they see the genuine thing. And there it is. In the home, where you work, with your family, in all kinds of relationships, that's what they see. Here is a person that walks. So his covenant loyalty is the same as the Lord God's. Gracious, kind, forgiving, long-suffering. And it will have its effect powerfully in the generation to come. Here's eight, and this will be our last proverb of the morning. A king is one who sits on a throne of judgment, winnowing all evil with his eyes. I want you to look at this proverb. It is a portrait. Look at it. Solomon is giving us a portrait. And the teachers of the text add this to us. It is the portrait of the ideal king. I'll explain that in a moment. You see, he is blameless and righteous because we see it in his judgment, in his rule. What does a king do? We're not familiar with kings. We're familiar with presidents and congress and politicians in every level. But this king, he, this, this providence that falls upon an individual, his role is entirely different from all of that. He is in the position here of deliberating that's the application of winnowing the law of Moses in his kingdom. I want you to look at this first observation. They're actually easy for us to find because they're the two participles of the proverb. Look, line one, who sits. Line two, who scatters. The top line begins with the portrait of the king. Here he is, regal, glorious, in all of his power, displayed in a very formal setting in his throne room. Now, if I was really dramatic, which I'm not, but if I were really dramatic, I would have had these doors fling open and trumpeters come in and blast away. Because that's the idea. This is the king. Here he is. Consider him. Look at him. Think about him. 
in royal authority, in righteousness. He is the vice regent of God upon the earth. What does that mean? That means he is the will of God in the place where he sits. He is God's ambassador. He is God's living representative. We don't have anything like that. But they did then, and we will in the future. More about that in a moment. And look at this. Line two of judgment. His position, his voice, it meant life or death. There was no court of appeals. There were no lawyers that came in and represented. The king listened and he made a ruling and he was absolute power. No other source to go to. That's the king. And that is this word judgment. The term refers to the the judicial process, decisions, arbitrations, legal rights. Here they are, right here, with this one individual. Now, specifically, I want you to consider line two, his sharp and discerning eye and its process. It sums up what he has witnessed. Now, I pointed this out when we did the sixth proverb of this chapter last time. But the king's vantage point is totally different. Remember? We go into the throne room. We're all looking at the king. We're looking at the king's face. But the king, he sees everybody's face all at once. And he's watching. He's scrutinizing. And he is learning as he listens. That's this word, judgment. And look at this concept. The concept is winnowing. Means of separation, used of a threshing floor. And here was the grain in a big stack, and in the threshing floor, they would, with a big fork, lift it up, and the wind would separate the wheat from the chaff. That's the picture. And that's what the king is doing. He is making decisions in his regal power of what is best for his people. And that is his kingdom. That's important to remember. His kingdom are his people. And the greatest of the kings was David. But as we know, David was deeply flawed. So, go back and look at your proverb. Your proverb, written from Solomon, is telling us about only one king. The perfect king. The king of Salem. The ancient name for Jerusalem. Who rules in absolute power, but at the same time he is a priest who rules in absolute righteousness. That's who's going on. Now you think I was being silly by talking about those trumpeters breaking through those doors? Well, I wasn't. I was preparing you. I was preparing you for the trumpets of the New Testament. And here they were. John the baptizer. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one more powerful whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn and will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, the possessive, the masculine possessive, four times used by John. His, his wheat, his threshing floor, his winnowing fork. 
It's all His. Why? Because He is a great King and we are by life on this planet subject to Him. We all are subject to Him. And we will all answer to Him. Every one of us that draws a breath on this planet will answer to the King. What did you do in my kingdom for righteousness for my people? So said our Lord Jesus. When you're good to them, you're good to me. But Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you in need of anything? But you did it to them. And in doing it to them, you did it to me. That's the king who rules over everything. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study in the Proverbs this morning. Thank you for this class and for the diligence of the people at Believer's Chapel to hear the Word of God, to ponder the Word of God, to absorb the Word of God, that it would become a part of us that we would think differently and act differently because we have a different destiny from all others. We are the subjects of your kingdom and to you be glory, Lord Jesus, forever and ever. Amen.